Alex, welcome to the Tej Talks podcast. Thanks for having me, Tej. You know, we haven't actually had a guest on where we've really focused on the management part of HMOs. Now, I've had a lot of HMO guests on, and I think this is going to be really useful for experienced people, um, but also people who are new, who who maybe even haven't even thought about this or even got there yet, and are actually deciding what strategy to do. Because I think some of the insight you're going to give today is going to show people, well, ooh, maybe I don't want to do HMOs or yeah, it's a challenge and maybe I do want to do it. So I'm quite looking forward to, you know, hearing people's opinions on this and, and getting some insight from you. But before we get into that, before we get into the, the source of the podcast, could you just tell us a little bit about you? Excellent. Yeah. So a little bit about me to give you a, a run through for my formative years. About 15 or, or 16 is, is the age when I really sort of got turned on to, to property and really became aware of property's uh, ability to, to make someone sort of make a better life for themselves. You know, property gives uh, an opportunity to build generational wealth. Um, I come from a fairly average background um, and was always been quite determined that that's not how I'm going to end. So I saw property as a way to, to do that. That was the, the start of it for me. So as I am now, I'm a property investor, developer and most recently a HMO agent. Okay and you with your HMOs you self-managed now that's I think anyone who has a HMO listening is probably thinking you're quite brave for doing that yeah what made you self-manage and how many were you self-managing? Yeah great question I think when you talk about HMOs to most people the one thing that puts people off is they think it's hassle and if they are interested in investing in HMOs, they've got no intention of managing themselves. But for me, um, I just, it was necessity really. I, at the time I was fairly young, tried a few high street agents and couldn't find one that was really delivering the service that I, I needed, I felt that I needed. So like I said, out of necessity, I, I took over responsibility for initially finding tenants and then slowly but surely more of the compliance and more of the management issues and to the point where I just took it on my on myself. And were they all close to you, the HMOs? Yeah, so I'm based in Cambridge and they're all within a sort of four, four to six mile um, circumference of, of the city. And you were full-time in property, right, at this stage when you were... Uh, no, actually, no. So I bought my first property when I was about 20 and I was working at that time as a uh, estate agent. I was a junior estate agent, just stacking money, thinking property, estate agency, good fit, right? Um, so yeah, so I was 20 and then shortly after there, I bought my first HMO and for a number of years, like I said, used, used high street agents. So I self-managed for about 10 years before then coming away from, from employment to then do that, do it full time. and develop Wow. Business. So you were part-time property investing, but mm. also then part-time, part-time managing. So you're doing almost two full-time jobs whilst also doing your full-time job. Absolutely. And that was, um, yeah, that was a massive challenge, massive challenge. And as we were doing quite well with the self-managing, we managed to meet people through networking events and family friends who were interested in sort of working with us to do theirs. And it got to the point where I saw an opportunity to, to jump ship and, and start a business. And, you know, why don't, you know, because it is a systemic problem, right? All over the country, everyone's going to be like nodding their heads. There's so many agents who can't manage HMOs. And in fact, in some areas, there may not even be agents who, I mean, they might take it on, but they yes. they really don't like even touch them. Yeah. I mean, there's good money to be made. Um, you know, obviously a world, a total, you know, difference to buy to let. You may never get a call for three months, six months in a buy to let. But why do they avoid HMOs? Because it makes money and agents love money. Yeah, absolutely right. I I think personally, HMOs, there's this connotation that there's there's more hassle associated with HMOs. And typically you're dealing with more people and more people equals more headaches. By to let, typically you're dealing with one tenant, one tenancy. HMOs, you can be dealing with six, seven, eight, you know, any number of people. With that comes its own challenges, which I think the traditional high street agents, if given the choice, would you like a single buy to let or do you want to manage this house of six people? Their preference is, is quite obvious. I mean, yeah. I I am with that preference. If I had an agency, I mean, there's a great niche here, of course, which you're in, but yeah. I, I wouldn't be doing that either. So how has, you know, you managing, self-managing and then sort of starting to meet people and managing theirs, how has that become what you do today? I, like I said, for a long period of time was self-managing and involved in uh, local uh, property networks and, and uh, Facebook groups and so on. And from there, you're hearing the same, same sorts of things. And you mentioned it yourself, people don't typically want HMOs because it's hassle. And coming from it from a landlord point of view, 
I saw it was a, it was a natural gap in the market to, to sort of fill that. HMOs make people more money, but that means the approach to managing HMOs because they're more hassle needs to be specialist. So why not build that service? And how many people do you have? Like, what, what, is your, what is your team structure? How do you make this now a business and not just you kind of running around and doing it? Yeah, so that's how it was for, for a long period of time. Hence why I've gone more grey quickly than I, than I thought I was. Um, but no, we've got a good team of people that work with us now, um, employed and contracted out. So VAs help massively in terms of um, the compliance and the, and the administration of HMOs. We've actually built our own system now based on Asana. We've built our own property management and CRM system combined in one, so that, that helps. And relationships with local contractors, local consultants. So we were able to offer that as a all-in-one package now. Mm, I like that. Cool. So, you know, if we if we kind of move into now the, the kind of real content of this this podcast, we want to share with people, or you want to share with people, how to manage HMO, how mm-hmm. to market it, and then also how to rent slash kind of compliance. So let's start off with, so just so people, so people who know HMOs, they know why HMOs are challenging to manage, right? But for people who don't know, yeah. you know, what are your, I don't know, three key things that make a HMO harder to manage than a buy to let for those people who are maybe deciding between the two of them? Yeah, excellent. So yeah, three three sort of key things that puts people off. I'd say number one is more people equals more problems. You're dealing with, as I said, you know, multiple tendencies, multiple uh, different personality types, six individuals that don't know each other, typically aren't related. They all have to get on under one one roof. So yeah, there's, there's lots to consider, not just in terms of the, the admin of the tenancy, but just in terms of the, you know, the social aspect. How do, how do six people that don't know each other get on? And oftentimes you're there as a, a bit of a, a referee, a bit of a shoulder to, to cry on sometimes, and, and that's all, all part, of the, part of the job, which if you're self-managing or a landlord, you might typically not want to be answering the phone at nine o'clock on a Saturday because someone's stolen your, your food, but there we are. The second point is with, be the um, is heavy management demands and the admin that goes along with HMOs. And sort of following on from that, the third thing would be more stringent uh, legal requirements. HMOs have many licensing, planning, health and safety laws that need to be to be managed, kept up to date with. And again, it's it's just much more complex than a standard standard buy to let. So. You know, those are three reasons that when, when I hear you speak about them and I look at my buy to let portfolio, I instantly can see the differences, you know, like, so yeah, one tenant or maybe two, but there's always one who you talk to the most. Absolutely. They don't have to get on with anyone. There's no, you know, if I, if I have a, a six bed HMO, you know, in, in a way you want to if somehow where possible ensure that they are going to kind of get on and are maybe similar and socially and that in itself is not a job in itself, but it's a, a big task. And it's a task that you know, needs a lot of thinking and perception by you. I don't need that. I mean, yeah, I need to perceive my tenant and we need to reference them and the stuff you do. But, you know, do I care that they might steal someone's milk? Not really, because they've got no one's milk to steal. So, yeah. um, and the com- compliance and complexity. Yeah. I mean, there's a world of difference. And even when you're building it, there's a world of difference, you know, in building regs and planning and things like that that you, you might need sometimes. Maintenance. I mean, do, with the maintenance piece, do you find that just naturally, because there's more humans and there's more turnover with them changing, moving in and out, that you are sort of having to repaint stuff and buff stuff? And is it kind of a continual maintenance cycle that's quite predictable? Yeah. Yeah. Great question. So I think HMOs generally get used quite heavily. Obviously, you've got people that are effectively renting their bedroom and the communal space is almost like an extra it's there but it's no one's responsibility so the landlord has to keep on top of the the sort of cleaning maintenance fixing of the the communal space and then again if you've got people that are typically confined to to a room that's that's their space where they they live sleep you know work that that gets used harder than than it would do in a in a normal house so definitely need a stringent sort of maintenance regime put in place in order to to pick up those things and there's some there's some easy things that people can do to, to keep on top of it and not let it not let it spiral. Yeah, and you know, again, comparing that to, to buy to let for people who are looking at both, for me, there's nothing predictable. And that's not that's not in a bad way. It just means that there is no sort of cycle. Like, yeah, when they leave, you know, might have to paint over the kind of furniture marks when they moved it, you, you know, yeah. a, a set a clean. But generally there's no sort of cycles. It's 
as and when, which means, yeah, obviously it costs less. There is less use. I mean, my tenants hopefully are going to be there till they have grandkids, you know, I mean, like 10, 20, 30 years. Yeah. And some of them, I already kind of feel like they will be. Um, and actually on that point, because, uh, you know, before we get into the, you know, how to improve your standards or have high standards, yeah. when it comes to voids and turnover, I mean, what's your average tenancy length? How often are you having to find new tenants? I really want to know that. Yeah, great question. So the, the turnover is higher. There's, there's no question about that. Well, to answer the question, I think the minimum tenancy term is six months. Um, our average tenancy is just over a year. We're averaging sort of 13, 14 months on average at the moment. And I think that's partly because we're not reliant on, on students. We're probably 65% professional and students, which is probably quite... Might be interesting to hear, based in Cambridge, obviously a big university uh, and student population here, but no, it's, it's predominantly more professional. But on voids, it's a great point. I think that's one of the benefits of HMOs. When we're talking about multiple tenancies, you've got six rooms. So you're spreading your risk across six different different income streams, effectively. So if one or two people leave, you're still getting income from four. And, you know, given a good notice period, you've still got plenty of time in order to, to sort of be proactive, market and find a replacement for that for that room. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. That's something that on buy to lets, you know, I have struggled with in the sense that, mm. you know, between I, I had a, one tenant, I think, leave a bit early, which they were always going to do. Um, but it was like a month, month and a half till we got someone in because I wanted it to be empty, wanted it to be clean. What, and then, lot, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah. But in that time, of course, I'm paying whatever on the mortgage. Yeah, it's, it's, it's such a small amount, but I'm paying it, isn't it? So, yeah. it, you know, it comes out of the top level profit. Mm. So let's talk about the standards in HMOs. Um, you know, if we look at old school HMOs, you know, I wouldn't even say Magnolia. I would say they're just worse than that. They're just, just, just a bit, I don't know, beige. Yeah. And like, uh, I, I see why they're like that because yeah. they will still get rent. Um, it's old school landlord, might be cash in hand rent, might not even be any ASTs. They've had it for 20 years. Yeah you know, it, it works. So if it ain't broke, why fix it in their opinion? But what can people do? Um, I suppose, you know, not maybe, not necessarily going into refurbishments deeply, yeah. but what could they do to improve their standards and to, you know, achieve good standards from the start? Yeah. Now you make a great point about the, um, the old school bedsits, you know, Magnolia, pie furniture that's probably older than the new tenants it's um it's not a pleasant place to live but i think the we've just come through this pandemic and i think that's been a great mirror to landlords of the need to to really improve standards and on your your question about how to improve i think it's quite it's quite easy to make some sort of cost effective incremental changes which really raise the standard things like a focus on interior design we joke about magnolia but there's no reason why you can't be a little bit creative with a colour scheme. So it's it's neutral, but still has a personality. And in the age of Instagram, right move and so on, when you're you're scrolling through multiple adverts, if you can create a product that jumps out at people, you're gonna get more clicks, which means you're gonna get more interest, which means you're gonna get more inquiries. So definitely interior design in terms of decoration, but on that point I would say furnishings as well. It doesn't cost a lot of money to buy, you know nice new bed as opposed you know, a design led bed as opposed to just a, a bulk standard and that i think is again something that will really raise the standard and then there's the the sort of soft touches or the the additional extras that people can put in so uh, super fast wi-fi you don't necessarily need to go for the cheapest if you put in one of the the best kits you've got six people typically working from home now you know that sort of thing would really help professional cleaners gardeners those sort of extras where your property is going to be looked after better and the tenants think that they're getting something more. It, it genuinely raises the tenant experience. I think uh, easy wins for, for landlords. I like it. And, you know, a lot of people are going to be thinking, how do I learn one of your points there about design mm. and about making it look swag? I mean, firstly, Instagram, Pinterest, yeah. uh, House Magazine, I think it's got two Zs at the end. <laughs> um, you know, Facebook. I mean, follow HMO investors. Follow and just look at how they do it. But um, Alex, do you, am I correct in saying that you you offer something that people could contact you about for free where you help them with the design or with something? Yeah, yeah, spot on. So we do a HMO sort of advice service, an improvement advice service. So we actually, as an example, we had a landlord come to us. They were with a, an agent and they had a couple of rooms that were sitting empty for about two months. So they shifted to us, thought, what can you do? 
So we went around there, inspected the property, put together a, a sort of a checklist of easy wins that they can put right quite quickly, quite cost effectively. As a result of doing those, we were able to rent the rooms and as an uplift on the entire property, we, we raised the rent from, well, the uplift is £6,000 a year um, for making some, some small changes. Mm, wow. That's a pretty big uplift um, for free. So people, if you've got HMO, then, you know, get in touch. I'm, I'll put, I'll put show, um, details in the show notes. But, you know, and I think that just goes to show, right, that the right knowledge, wherever it's from, the right input and making that change, I mean, that's a big increase. When you look at it on, like, return as a percentage as well, I'm sure that that was big. And who's going to say no to extra money for not necessarily having to spend that much and you spend it once every however many years right so. absolutely so not just the, the increase in the rents obviously the the speed of which you're able to fill voids so you've got a, a tenant in the property doesn't money in your pocket so yeah and i think as we're we're in touch with so you mentioned social media we're quite active on social media um, and we keep up to date with sort of trends and obviously speaking to a lot of tenants we're aware of uh, the latest tenant requirements so for us, giving landlords that advice, that's that's pretty easy for us. We're, we're, we're happy to do that and able to do that quite effectively. And so, you know, that's, in, you know, that's how to make the room look good and how to achieve high standards. And again, just to, you know, related to buy to lets, very similar, you know, yes. um, yeah. obviously they're not usually furnished, but generally what you're saying is right. And resolving defects, that's, that's something that, so when you get a call from a tenant, and yeah. they've got, you know, an issue that isn't their fault. Like they're not being silly. Like often they can be, it's <laughs> something that you actually have to fix. And it's, I don't know, it's a handyman, a handy woman fix that kind yeah. of level. Do you have like an SLA for how long from the call you want the person over there fixing it? Absolutely. So yeah, I think a big part of that is managing expectations. So before a tenant even moves in, we, we have some policies that we make them aware of. So they they know what type of repair request gets what type of response. And as long as we're delivering to that and they're aware of that, that tends to make the whole process a lot easier. But on that repairs, it just, I can't stress enough the, the importance of being responsive. It's, it's a way of stopping a little issue becoming a big issue, potentially saving a lot of money, but also keeps your tenants happy. Mm, yeah, I agree. And I mean, do you get tenants who, I mean, I'm sure you do, but do you get tenants who perhaps expect too much like from the start and you've kind of had to be like, look, this is how it's going to work. Or like, mate, it's one tiny light bulb. Can you just chill? Like, have you ever had that kind of situation? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's quite common though, isn't it? With, um, it's people generally, right? And I, I think that's why I say that property is, is a people business. It's not about bricks and mortar. It's about people. So if you're aware of, um, I think what I'm trying to say is most people don't do that deliberately. Perhaps they, this might be the first time they've lived in a property or they're just genuinely not aware of what the responsibilities for the landlord are and what the tenant should be doing. So yeah, we try and work with them. We're, we're, we're quite collaborative on that and, and um, that tends to solve a lot of issues. And also we've got troubleshoot guides and, and sort of manuals that really help to, to solve those issues. Nip it in the bud early, really. Cool. And so, you know, that's kind of a bit about the standards. Let's talk about advertising. Uh, you know, HMOs, especially in certain areas, are quite saturated. Yeah. It's quite competitive. And there are a fair few, you know, good investors who are doing amazing designs. And actually, maybe with time and as more people do HMOs, it will get tougher and tougher and you really need to stand out. So, you know, what is your sort of tips or insight on how to advertise and to get people interested in your rooms over someone else's? A couple of good uh, tips. Easy wins would be great photography. And... If you're not confident to do it yourself, definitely get a, a professional photographer in. I think you'd be surprised at how affordable they can be and the difference it makes in terms of in the photography. We mentioned interior design, but a sort of stage on from that would be stationing the rooms. Let people know how they can use the spaces. What, and let them imagine what it's going to be like to live in these things. So again, staging, very cost effective. It makes such a big difference. And for us personally, social media has been a, been a godsend, I think, with things like TikTok and, and Instagram, Facebook, you're able to reach such a broad market and not necessarily reliant on, on the portals. It's not just a case of putting an advert up there. You can be speaking to these people, yeah, collaboratively. And what about, now I know with certain social medias, your copy or your content, how you write it, you know, keywords, yeah. things like that, can be really important. Now, most adverts I see for rental or for sale for properties, 
don't really have a write up. It's bedroom, back room, front room. <laughs> and you kind of argue in a way that, especially for like a buy to let rental, when the demand everywhere is ridiculously high. Yeah. You know, do you really need it? Um, no, I, I don't think so necessarily. Mm. Looking at how much the demand is, what are your thoughts on that? You know, with HMOs in terms of the write up and how you describe it and what you're saying about. It? Yeah, yeah, no, great point. I think it's it, the write up is important. I think um, I would uh, to give people a, a sense of of what this, the property is. You've got to sell the good points, right? And instead of it being as you just described, you know, double bed, this, this, you try and give them a story and a sense of what this property can offer them. But on that, I'll keep the, the write-up quite succinct because in the age of scrolly, scrolly, people aren't necessarily wanting to read chapter and verse. It just needs to be very succinct, capture their attention and, and be benefit, benefit led really. Yeah, and I think with, with photographs, I mean, when I do buy to lets, I think I pay mm. about 100, 110, maybe 100 pounds for photos and a video. So yeah. for HMO, maybe you pay double that, maybe, um, but, I mean, for the amount you're going to spend on that refurb oh, yeah. and the dressing, and I mean, it, it's your baby. It's, it's It should be gorgeous. Spend money on that. Like, yeah, I know what you mean. Like, I've seen some photos where I'm just like, yeah, not even the right orientation. It's just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who the hell's going to stay here? People do though, right? Like, it, someone always needs somewhere to stay. So, Absolutely. if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Is what is what the kind of old school um, people would say. Yeah. So, you put your advert out there. Yeah. You've got a few applicants, hopefully quite a few. Um, how do you select the right one? Yeah. Um, because I, I know on Spare Room, they kind of maybe fill a profile in. So you might know a few details, but do you have a process where they fill like a Google form in? Or how, how do you take them from applicant to sort of a potential tenant? Yeah, this is a great point. And I, I think this is probably one of the most important aspects of renting rooms. I think as an investor, you can, you can be... Um, quite focused on getting some money in. So, you know, you, you can potentially be a bit hasty with trying to get people in the room, get some money generated. But again, as we mentioned before, having multiple people in a house is, is, a, is a dynamic and you, you have to try and manage that. So in order to capture the, the, the applicants, like you mentioned, spare room, they fill a profile in, but we have um, a form, a registration process that they fill in, which is by and large generic, but then there's a section in there about personality and character type. So we really try and understand the person. But as a, after that, we call all tenants, even before we, we start showing them around. So we, we call it like a, a soft screening. So we effectively interview the tenants and, and try and build a bit of a relationship with them and, and understand what they're about, what their requirements are. And yeah, that's kind of how we move them along, along the process. I think it's a, it's a good thing there to be speaking to them on the phone before getting them in. I think it's yeah. tempting to just get people in, oh, let's get viewings, let's get interest. Yeah. But doing that saves your time you can also stay you don't have to leave and they sort out of viewing but sure. do you find that it also creates more of a want in them because they kind of feel like oh i'm being interviewed for this place i'm kind of like whoa i gotta apply for it does yeah. that like, happen yeah yeah dead right i think they maybe take it a bit more seriously and they view you differently they're like this guy's taking this very seriously so if he's like that with me he's like that with the other guys this is and you'll know quite quickly this is either something that appeals to them or something that puts them off yeah, I like that. I mean, I know my agent who finds my tenants for buy to let do, does this very soft screen at the start. Mm. And, and it makes a difference because most would just say, here's the time, book it in, so you're there. <laughs> and it's just kind of like in, out, in, out. And yes. it's those little things on the tenant experience, right? That, yeah. that people, that most agents, well, let's say traditional agents, and even a lot of newer landlords, landladies don't think about, but they're humans and they're your customers, right? They're, they're paying the bills. Absolutely. And you'll be with them for, for the next, you know, at least six months. So you want to get on Yeah. Right. And actually, go, going back to that point, actually, about tenancy lens, you know, you said about kind of 12, 13 months. Mm. Is that good or is that average, do you think, across sort of, if people who are new to HMOs, is that kind of what they should be expecting or is that what the best can expect? Um, no, I think that's probably, to be fair, that's probably sort of market, market average. We do quite well to, we, again, we say 13 to 12 to 13 months as, a, as an average. I think we we have the people that stay longer than that because they're they're more comfortable. But I think generally speaking, HMOs are viewed as sort of short term short term rentals, a stopping gap. Maybe people are relocating for work and testing the water before they move on. But um, no, I think it's it's about there. Hmm. Okay. And so if we kind of move on to maybe more of the management, how do you handle 
all those maintenance requests and also the the compliance stuff as well because it is more slightly more complex i know it differs england wales and scotland but you know you've got certain documents you have to serve on tenancy because if you don't it can like invalidate it and then you have an even harder time again makes no sense to me ridiculous and also you know like checking right to rent now because you know you work for the home office i don't understand (laughs) like all of this bullshit the government does yeah talk to me about Compliance first, I suppose, because that comes maybe earlier. Yes. And then talk about maintenance. Yeah, okay, so compliance. So from our, our point of view, like I mentioned, we built this this system, which which really helps. Um, it's a bit of a checklist on terms of what needs to be in place, when it needs to be renewed, and that's all automated. So the, we sort of remove the human element from, from sort of messing that up. Actually, just on that, we've got a HMO management plan, which covers all of that, which is a downloadable link from our website. But thought I'd just mention that. Yeah, for, for a self-managing investor or, or somebody, not you definitely need to schedule that out. So maybe the use of a, a spreadsheet linked to a calendar so you know what's happening, what needs to happen, when it's happening. And again, compliance checklist, speak to the local authority or your local lettings agent to understand exactly what it is that you need to have in place and the regularity that that needs to be, be maintained. Compliance is, for HMOs is one of the, it's probably the most crucial element I think to, to making sure that you stay compliant with HMOs is such a such a challenge and they're always moving the goalposts as well so need to stay updated I suppose that's why people like me when we, when we find tenants we use an agent because yes it's paperwork but I'd honestly rather pay someone to do it um, you know, even if it's just for the tenant find, I'd much rather someone else has, I know we're realty, we're also liable, but I'd rather there was someone else there who knew more, was a professional, does it every day, day in, day out. Um, it's a mind. Yeah. And you said spreadsheet linked to a calendar. Mm. That's a good tip. I would say most people, if you're managing an HMO or multiple, I would have some sort of software. Yeah. There's a few different, you know, types. And I think I've had people on who've created them, but yeah. I would definitely have something. Um, I have it for, for buy to lets. I, do I need it? Eh, arguably not, but it's got a nice yeah. interface and it looks, you know, but for HMOs, I, I would, I would struggle without any sort of proper yeah. property management software. So do you use that software as well for maintenance? Like does it track the whole sort of journey? Yeah. So no, we don't, like I said, we, we built our own. It's sort of based on a, an Asana system, but there are companies out there. Was it Arthur online? Good Lord. A couple of, couple of, softwares like that which would be which would be good how do you track maintenance and then how i suppose how do you deal with it you know is it someone in the office just kind of putting two and two together and getting it sorted or how does that system work yeah so we've got quite a defined route for for managing maintenance and again managing expectations so the tenants know exactly what type of repair they've got how they need to log that and from that that's then logged and, and captured on our system and it's a pretty much whole life system and it's transparent so the tenant can see exactly where we are with their repair request so there's never any of this oh you said it was going to be done and it hasn't been done or nothing's moved so you know if you're making phone calls to, to try and line up other tradesmen to get them in they can see that it's transparent and it's it's visible in real time so yeah it's cradle to grave that's managed by we've got a customer experience manager who looks after all of that and keeps the keeps the tenants happy speaks to the uh the trades and, and sorts all that all that out and i find something with in most letting agents i've i've spoken to I would not even touch their trades with a barge pole. I would never use them. I would never use the letting agent to organize it because somehow, whether they're taking a cut off it, they claim they don't, I don't know. Their their tradespeople are just like expensive. And I just find they're not, if they get a handyman in, he literally knows how to paint a wall and put some like they're just not very skilled yeah. um but then i know some agents actually or, or i know builders who work yeah. with agents and they're amazing i mean when it comes to finding your tradespeople, you know is there a process is it is there always some trial and error like or is it kind of all referenced and vetted in a, in a different process yeah absolutely so i think the difference with us is i come from a hmo investor background so i'm not a, a quote-unquote agent so our approach is just fundamentally different. I view getting trades on board just the same as you would as an investor. And I think that gives us a bit of an advantage um, in terms of what the type of people we work with. And it's probably maybe people that we've used before on our own projects before we'll even offer them out to, to clients. That's the difference, right? So mm-hmm. most letting agents, I suppose, aren't property investors or haven't been. So they don't like think of it from our perspective. Absolutely. They don't you know, vet them maybe like how we would. And obviously we're very, very strict. Obviously, yeah. 
you know, things do slip by. Mm. Um, and lastly, HMOs, you know, are going to bring some nightmare situations, are going to bring some things that we really, you know, don't want to deal with or don't want to even remember. But tell me about a situation you faced maybe recently that, you know, was a bit of a problem or a big problem. Yeah. Okay. So one that springs to mind quite recently was um, we had a tenant, it doesn't happen very often, but we had a tenant that fell into arrears and arrears is everyone's worst nightmare, right? No rent being received, tenant in situ. But again, our approach is quite people led. We try not to be, don't try and beat anyone with a stick. We much rather work with them on a human level first, understand the situation. So with this, this tenant, we got in contact with them and after breaking down the, the arguments, we understood that the reason for them not paying the rent is because they've been initially on furlough and then made redundant as a result of the, the pandemic. And the reason they didn't want to tell us is because they thought if they declared the fact that they're now unemployed, that that meant, you know, no job, no home. But no, quite the, quite the opposite. So we, we helped them. We've got good connections with the local, local councils. So we were able to get them applying for universal credit and worked with them and the landlord to try and manage that process. By doing that and being involved, we were able to keep the landlord updated. He knew when he was getting his money. He felt confident he was getting his money. So that sort of dropped the pressure on, on rushing with any legal proceedings. The tenant felt that we were genuinely trying to help as opposed to just badger them for some money. But yeah, long story short, we, we eventually got it, got it resolved. All the rears have now been brought up to date. And um, yeah, just through, communication and, and working with people is we managed to get that solved mm. and i think there's there's kind of mistakes on both parts when this happens like the a lot of you know property investors uh, maybe not so much the new ones but mm. maybe will not see them as human or yeah. clients or customers they'll see them as tenants which you know is such an old school word that has certain you know meanings yeah and they kind of maybe see them like that when actually they have a job and family and friends. They're the same as us, just in a different position in life. Absolutely. Um, and I think, like you said, that it's important to understand that. But on the of, of the same thing, a lot of tenants don't communicate. Now, a lot of them will blame and say, oh, yeah, but, you know, so many landlords would just kick us out. And, yeah, yeah. some would, you know, the kind of ones you find in the Daily Mail. Um, <laughs> but, you know, there's, there's sort of like a, a thing. There's like a war between both where, like, one thinks the other one's not human, and the other thinks the other one's not human. And then they just don't talk because one's scared of this. And we're scared of, well, if yeah. we try and do anything, we're going to be stuck with you for 12 months. We're yeah. effed. And the government obviously don't help. So, no. you know, I definitely see the human side. But I've also had, you know, I've also put CCJs on tenants before, you no, know, because mm. they didn't pay rent. And yeah. they just wouldn't, they would not communicate. So I said, oh, here we go, have this then. You mm. know, enjoy your credit for the next nine years. Um, <laughs> Because it, it had to be done. But then I've had other ones where we, it was just like, oh, you know, work, we're paying her late, so she had to pay a few debt. I was like, fine. Yeah, absolutely. Do your thing. Um, but what's really nice, and I'm sure you get this from your tenants, is when they kind of turn around and say, you know, wow, you you fixed that really quickly. Or like, you know, you work with that was that you you worked with us yeah. and they're surprised. Now they shouldn't be, because like what we do should be normal. But it really shows you how bad some agents and some investors can be when like tenants are so surprised by us just being normal. I'm just like, what yeah. What do you mean? This right. is how we manage stuff. Um, so Alex, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I think you've given a really nice journey in the various steps of managing, um, improving the standards, compliance, and really how to operate you know an hmo from an investor's perspective but also you know kind of from a, a letting agent's perspective who's on the ground and, and doing it yeah. so i will put your contact details in the show notes but if people want to get a hold of you what, what's the best way for them to do it yeah so i mean you can email me direct it's uh, alex at baburis.co.uk it's b-a-b-o-u-r-i-s or um our website baburis.co.uk or instagram at baburis underscore hmo Amazing. Alex, thank you so much. Thank you, buddy.